Anyway, while Fatima takes her seat, let me just welcome you all to the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be able to host this conversation and to see a lot of friends um, who come back when we do discuss Yemen, and I'm always happy to have the opportunity uh, to do so once again, when, and this time with such a distinguished group of people who can help us look at Yemen from a little different angle, and we try to do this from time to time. In the last conversation we had, when Peter Salisbury was here, we were talking about kind of how do we define and determine and identify elements in Yemen that maybe can mobilize resources themselves and others in support of efforts to, A, in the first instance, help this conflict come to a, a merciful end, and then B, in a post-conflict scenario, uh, mobilize those resources further in terms of, in the interest of developing governance structures and things that the country is going to need uh, as it moves itself forward. Uh, and one of those elements, of course, that I think is most salient and certainly in, has proven itself to be most resilient in Yemen is civil society. Uh, and Yemen has been blessed with a very strong civil society sector. And within civil society, of course, youth and youth activism have played an enormously important uh, and potent role, uh, not just in recent years, certainly that's been the case, but I think historically as well. And so what we'd like to do today is take a look at this component of civil society, that is to say, Yemen's youth. And there was, of course, a, 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 a wonderfully dynamic movement that came to be in 2011 that really did supercharge the, the popular revolt that uh, did away with Ali Abdullah Saleh's government and moved forward uh, 2011 and then National Dialogue Conference 2012 exercised a lot of influence there. And my question, and then we'll be posing this to our panelists, uh, is what now? Uh, where are all these young people? And can we somehow cobble together this resource uh, to some kind of a constructive and defining end for Yemen? So with that, let me just introduce briefly our panelists. And I will not do so at the length they deserve, because all the information you need to know about them is in this little handy handout you've gotten. Um, but to my right is Fatima Abu al -Asrar who is a senior analyst for the Arabia Foundation. And I would just add, incidentally, uh, was a research associate here at AGSIW. So she's an distinguished alumna of the organization. I'm always delighted to welcome you back. Thank you, Fatima. Uh, to Fatima's right is uh, Aussan Kamal, who is based in the UK, working for the Oxfam Yemen team as Yemen humanitarian campaign lead. And then to the right of Aussan is Walid al-Hariri, who heads the New York office of the Sana'a Center for Strategic Studies. So I welcome you all. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, and I look forward to a conversation that can help us identify some of these issues, certainly from the perspective that you all will bring. So um, what I'm going to do is just kind of throw out maybe an overarching question to our panelists, and they can take it up or not as they choose, and that's certainly going to be the case. I don't want to have too many stock presentations other than my own, obviously, which I've uh, already <laughs> dispatched with. Um, but beyond that, the question really is, um, given the strong dynamic past of Yemen youth activism, um, and now in, the, in that kind of in the midst of this conflict where Yemen has fractured so badly, can we still speak about a youth movement? Is there still a cohesive, coherent sense of where Yemeni youth come together around a common cause, or has that fractured along with the rest of the country and the rest of its society? So let me begin with Fatima, and we'll move on from there. Fatima, please. Um, right. um, thank you so much for uh, having me, Steve. Um, on the question of uh, a unified Yemen youth, you know, and whether they're capable of doing this, I think it's really misguided to think of them as unified at any point in time. There was an independent youth movement in 2011. Uh, the movement uh, has, has diverged and had had different interests from different political parties. So uh, in, in the change square, you had people who were affiliated with uh, the joint meeting parties, who were uh, with Islah and other, and uh, perhaps some of the socialists. Um, th there was just established political agendas that have taken over an independent youth movement uh, uh, in Yemen. Um, it, there was also the uh, Houthi supporters as well, uh, who took place in, in the demonstrations as 
they really were trying to overthrow, you know, the, the government at that time uh, perceived as, as corrupt. Uh, they had really core conflict issues and grievances that were important. So you had different, different actors on the scene. But most importantly, it's important to remember that, you know, it was not just an independent youth movement. You know, there was, there was this notion that, you know, there was an, an, an optimism around this movement that uh, uh, these are people who have legitimate grievances. But at the end, I think it was really politicized and carried over by different political parties and different agendas. Great. Thank you very much. Waleed, any thoughts on that, on kind of what, what came or what has come now of the youth movement? And, and yet, as Fatima was saying, maybe there wasn't a coherent, cohesive movement, but was there a common ground that seemed to stitch it all together? Uh, first, uh, first to put, uh, to, uh, to put this into perspective, if I, I could define youth, who are the youth that we are talking about? Um, to me, I will say the youth are the youth influencers or the creators. Uh, those are the future of Yemen. They're going to come in and they're going to uh, uh, take over at some point. Um, they also could be composed of those politically aware, politically active, uh, have networks, um, uh, media savvy. These are individuals who have this influence within the, uh, within the, the governing spheres and the social spheres as well. Uh, and they are also the drivers, I will say, for what, you, what we will say, the, the youth in Yemen. Um, I will say currently, to answer your question, they are, uh, as a movement, they are divided. Uh, as, as also Fatima said, uh, th at some point they were unified in the beginning, early beginning of the revolu uh, uh, uprising in 2011. They came from across Yemen millions uh, under common, common agenda or common theme, which is to, uh, to change the corrupt and, and oppressive regime of Ali Abdullah Saleh. After the, after, uh, the process went ahead, they then uh, went, uh, went, uh, went around to uh, their, some of their original bases, political uh, alliances or uh, religious beliefs or uh, uh, different groups, and some of them were taken into the process that uh, didn't uh, achieve what, uh, their aspirations. Um, I would say they are, at the moment they are not unified. We cannot identify them as a movement, and this is because of the, the war. The war have uh, divided them along religious, political, and ideological lines. Um, uh, and I will uh, elaborate more as we continue. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, Sam, with that in mind, and kind of what Walid is alluding to is the fact that kind of after 2012 and the National Dialogue Conference dissipated and, and then when the conflict itself began, um, the Yemeni youth tended to kind of drift away a bit, uh, out of Sana'a back to areas that maybe they call home and some of the more rural areas, and they developed more community-based uh, activities. Is that your sense of where the, maybe the, this movement, if it is a movement, exists now? Is that where the youth are most active? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, and it's a pleasure to be in front of a full room. Um, so where we are today, um, I guess I can go into the how it's developed at that local level, but before we go into that, we have to always understand that youth are not one so solid group. Mm -hmm. They've always had competing interests, but follow the common interest. And this is we see this across the world in all civil society movements, be it in, in the US or in Yemen. So potentially this is how it goes. But what we really need to understand about the youth movement now is it has lost a lot of its brains. It's, there is a mm -hmm. current brain drain that's happened in the country, causing a lot of the youth members to leave the country. Now you want to call them refugees, or you want to call them diaspora, it's, it's, it's a term that we need to discuss, but it's something that's <coughs> causing, um, causing groups, uh, causing this group uh, a, 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 sh a shift from that national level to, to the local level. And I agree with Walid that it is a group that was supported by um, a knowledgeable, well-educated group of people who was supporting a wider movement. But we have to remember, legitimacy doesn't come from education. Mm -hmm. Legitimacy sometimes comes from action. And what I saw in 2011, which was amazing to see in Change Square, is that a lot of the doctors and nurses who were in, in Change Square actually had more legitimacy than those who were reading out the speeches right. because they were saving lives. Um, which turns me back to that localization of the youth movement and what's happening today. Um, I was in Sana'a only a few months ago, and what you see is members of the youth movement 
um, new groups and 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 who I would say people who weren't even involved in the youth movement in 2011, um, younger. Uh, the, the next generation of youth now doing humanitarian, civil society work, gender work, um, uh, looking at rights, really calling out on, the, on what's happening on the ground. Um, it continues to happen. Now, at the localized level, what we are seeing is definitely there is this whole, from an organizational perspective, when we go out and talk to, to, um, to um, our beneficiaries, um, there are definitely youth and women who are there on the ground trying to resolve conflict, trying to be part of the conversation, and really providing the space for others to, to enter. Um, some of those voices are strong and loud, um, and some of those voices are trying to, to find a space for them to, to be part of the conversation. I think across the country, it's diversifying, it's changing. Um, the fact that they've lost a lot of the, the old leadership of youth, um, is, is causing for new, new people, um, um, uh, uh, younger people to come through. Um, we're seeing that in Aden, we're seeing mm -hmm. that in Sana'a. Um, and, and that's because of the, the fact that a lot of the youth that were already there in 2011 are no longer in Sana'a. Mm. Um, so the, a lot of people that I used to speak to are, are just not there anymore. They're either in the region or back in, in, in a third country somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, this is a, a fascinating point because I'm looking at three Yemenis here um, <laughs> who are, you know, who basically embody this. Uh, you know, you, you've been, for whatever reason, forced to leave, and you know, you still do work in Yemen or on Yemen, and still, in many ways, Yemen is that critically important part of you that n animates much of what you do. But what is the likelihood of of people like yourself being able to go back, and people that you know being able to go back at some point? and resume the kind of work that you want to do, but at, back in Yemen. Is that something you think about? Do you think the Yemeni youth, if we, again, I don't want to speak in general terms, but are people motivated to kind of think about that as, as a future option? That's a, it's a tough question. Um, I know Walid uh, in the Sana'a Center have been working on, you know, sort of like the next generation leadership uh, in Yemen and, you know, looking at how do we uh, invest in, in the capacities that are existing outside of the country and have them to loop them into the conversation mm -hmm. and have their expertise uh, become helpful uh, if, um, in the rebuilding of Yemen in the future. The, the, the situation is definitely, I would say it's, it's just more complex. I think it's, it's a little bit uh, hopeful at the time. We're still in, in conflict, we're still in war. Um, there is a majority of the people who are trapped in the conflict and som sometimes even often feel betrayed by, you know, people who are outside of the country who are able to express their opinions freely. At other times, I feel that, you know, my voice become a channel for those who are unable to express their opinions and their views. Uh, so I can't tell you, like, since the, uh, I mean, uh, specifically since Saleh's execution in December 4th last year, Many people have in Yemen and many activists have reached out and, you know, amid uh, a, a media and, and internet uh, uh, crackdown. Uh, so the Houthis have suspended uh, 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 internet on social media and, and social media communication, basically. And people reached out to just talk about their issues, talk about their suffering. They are unable to organize in the way that they've organized before. I mean, one thing I think we, we often um, don't mention or we take for granted, seven years ago when this happened in 2011, uh, there was an environment that was conducive to having protests and having people come together and uh, talk about their issues and their grievances because there was a state. You know, there were international organizations present. There were civil society present, um, media institutions. So there were, there were entities that could hold the executive accountable for what it's doing. And that somewhat was a safety valve for many of, of the activists. They, they felt really fearless. I remember, um, I remember I was visiting Yemen actually in 2011 at the onset of what was going on. And it was just uh, after uh, uh, the Tunisian president uh, was, uh, was forced to step down. And, uh, you know, my friends, a friend of mine had, had organized a group of youth uh, to go and protest in front of the Tunisian embassy. And for me, it didn't make sense. I was like, but the president is already gone. So why, why are you protesting? And he said, you don't get it. We want this one to go too, <laughs> you know, <laughs> speaking of Saleh. And, and the environment was conducive for that. You know, um, 
Tawakkul Karman, the, the Nobel laureate, was, was imprisoned and, and let go. She wasn't tortured. She wasn't, you know. So the, the, the environment was different. People felt confident. Right now, you don't know what to expect. You know, after Saleh's execution, uh, I mean, we've seen just crackdown on freedoms of expression and information. We've seen a, a, a women's demonstration that was violently crushed, you know, when they tried to mobilize. Just a just few weeks ago, there was a, an execution of an activist in, in Taiz, you know, just like a cold-blooded assassination of, not execution, but assassination of Friham al Badr. And she was a human rights activist who was just documenting violations that are done by the Houthi militia. So the, the environment there is, is just not helpful. I can't tell you how many Yemeni people that I speak to who are helping me with research come back to me and say, hey, we think, you know, we're going to go for a trip here or there, and from there we're going to ask for an asylum. And I can't say, no, stay in the country, because it just can't. Like, I know what they're going through, and I know, you know, it, it, the type of grievances have also shifted. Before, there was demand for economic grievances. They had economic grievances that drove so much of... of uh, of, of the protest, right now it's human rights, you know, violations, it's fear for the lives. People are just becoming more fearful with time. Um, sorry to give this grim picture. I know, I'll, I know a lead will have probably a little bit more in terms of, you know, how you're organizing for the future. And I, I, I am sort of like a member uh, in this, uh, or I've done some studies uh, in, in, in this, so I think you could elaborate on it. Yeah, well, later, I'm, I'm curious, you, Fatima saying. mentioned the fact that you, yes. you at the Sana'a Center, you're working on maybe next generation leadership issues. Can you describe some of that work for us? Um, uh, in, in general, it is very challenging because the war is continuing. If you want to, we are thinking about how to engage youth in any processes or when. Uh, that, that's a continuing question. And ultimately, we feel that the, the conflict have to stop first. They have to stop to provide some room for youth to play some ro uh, 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 role. Um, but something that also we are guilty of as international community and even as um, uh, representatives of a, uh, those representatives of the state is that uh, youth are the forgotten. Uh, always, mm -hmm. even in the former regime, 33 years. We were thinking about what Yemen has in terms of resources. We had something unique, which is the, uh, the human capital. We never, uh, they didn't uh, invest on youth. They are innovators, uh, innovators educators. They, uh, they go to outside the country and they, uh, they succeed in many different fields. But even now, youth, they find themselves again being neglected. And during the transitional process, the Gulf country, the Gulf, the GCC, and the international community was engaging more actively and directly with political parties, not with youth, uh, in, a, in a more meaningful way. At the moment, we feel that they are marginalized in the international sphere, in the local sphere. They they cannot feel safe. And even if you look at the grants, when it comes to helping them finance their small initiatives. Uh, 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 that's one mentioned in local communities. They feel that they don't have enough resources. They have to go outside. And that, those innovators you see in Yemen, they go outside and they, they transform it from being uh, uh, creatives into being individuals in a survival mode. They need to f live day by day. They, they leave their, uh, their, uh, uh, their work, their aspirations, their hopes. Uh, to live day by day until this war ends, and the attachment's still there about their attachment to the country, but we uh, there need to be some uh, support from the international community or more focus to them. Many countries always ask about what can we do? They cannot maybe sometimes sp uh, stop the conflict. They cannot stop uh, the warring parties or pressure them to some extent for some other countries. But what they could do is they could help Yemen, the future of Yemen, to build in the future of Yemen, invest in the youth who will who will be ultimately in the future, who will uh, who will be in the face of Yemen, and give them the skills, give them the resources. There are some so, some basic things that you just need to engage with them and uh, listen to them, uh, and uh, you will see a lot of difference. Uh, if not if not now, in the future. Mm -hmm. And Hassan, you were back in December, um, and in the course of your time in Yemen, then did you have contact with? kind of youth activists who were involved in some of the humanitarian mm -hmm. and the developmental issues that Oxfam uh, may it itself be involved in? And how do you, what, what was kind of their attitude about the, both, the, you know, where they were, what they were able to do, what the environment allowed them to do in the middle of a conflict, as we all said? Uh, I mean, how, 
how constricted and how restricted were the opportunities for youth to undertake some of the activities that they might want to do? Thank you for that question. Um, if I just go back to where are, where are the, lead, the, the local leaders and, and youth and what are they doing now? And will they return? I just I, I mm -hmm, think, think there is a willingness to return if, yeah. if the situation allows. Uh, what are they doing now? Um, a lot are getting exposure to the West, as I have done for many years, um, and the East. There are, there are a couple of my friends in Japan um, and, and everywhere else. And this is, this is a positive, yes. Um, there's Walid, there's others from the Sana Center, there's Fatima, there's others. Um, I wouldn't call myself a youth anymore. I'm 33. Yeah. Um, it's all relative. <laughs> <laughs> Although, under certain conversations in Yemen, I will be youth until 40. Um, <laughs> um, but to be truthful, um, what are they doing? They are doing a lot. Um, now, um, I would like everyone to understand that 70% of the Yemeni population is a youth population, mm -hmm. and they yeah. still live inside Yemen, a prison without walls mm -hmm. that's imploding on them. That's getting worse. Um, the humanitarian situation doesn't allow for people to do much more than try to survive and look after their livelihoods. So it's a really hard context to be talking to someone about activism or rights when things are getting really bad. Yeah. So we need to consider that. So that's in, in part what's happening. In major cities, Hadramaut is seeing a flourishing youth movement. Aden is seeing a flourishing youth movement. And what I've seen in Sana'a is a flourishing youth movement in that they are reacting to the humanitarian situation. People are trying to help. There are youth initiatives on the ground delivering as much as international organizations are. And this has to be understood, mm. supported by local money, supported by businessmen, and supported by their own families. Whatever people can give, they will give. There's still barrels of water outside people's homes for those who can't afford to get the water. So you see that at all levels. Um, in in, in Sana'a, what I've seen is, a, and, and in Aden, from, I haven't been to Aden, but from what I have what I have been able to talk to people about, and from our programming, certainly, there is a flourishing civil society movement. I have met a leader of an organization who was in Change Square in 2011, who is running a $7 million program, humanitarian program. This is a four-year-old local organization led by local Yemenis from local areas. We are not talking about a centralized organization here which sits in Sana'a alone. It's a movement. Yes, mm -hmm. that's a huge program to be running in a conflict setting. So we are seeing this flourish. We are seeing new avenues open other than just human rights and activism. Um, the risks are huge. They face mm -hmm. similar risks, if not worse than us as international organizations on the ground. That's from traveling around the country all the way to uh, the risk of being arrested for saying the wrong thing to the wrong person. Um, it is a conflict setting. There are different parties. You need to be very aware of what you're saying, where you're saying it, and how you're saying it. Um, and it could be interpreted, and you could be saying something totally humanitarian, and it's interpreted in a totally different manner. So they are facing huge risks on the ground. They have a lot of pressure on the ground. And I totally respect that we have a youth flourishing movement from the outside. There was also a diaspora movement in 2011 that we cannot forget. Now, that has died down to an extent. I mean, I came from a diaspora movement in the UK. Um, and the groups that I used to work with and mobilize with about humanitarian issues in the UK are not as active as they used to be. Um, and it's just become a really odd dynamic of certain people sitting outside waiting for the opportunity to go back in and do something. But at the same time, there are people in the country who are already performing, already delivering on the ground on both human rights issues and humanitarian issues and engaging with the government, engaging with international parties, engaging with um, regional parties to ensure that the people of Yemen get the best deal that they can get within a conflict setting. Right. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answers your question. Well, no, it's fascinating. And you can, I mean, it's hard to imagine the constraints under which people are operating in, in a conflict situation where everything gets to be politicized. Even mm -hmm. humanitarian assistance becomes something that parties to the conflict want to filter or distribute to their loyalists. So that, you know, even if you have the best of all intentions to do something good for Yemenis in general, you're going to be pressured to say, no, my, this community needs it because they're faithful to us and we want that, that support to go to them. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So how do how do the young people that you know how do they kind of square that circle? How do they you know how do they get around that pressure to do the kind of work that you've described? Is it just a little bit at a time? Do you you are able to curry favor or gain influence or and then while you're just talking about a, a long term problem in Yemen, which is youth being disregarded, um, not being factored into the political equation with the same level of interest that they merit by both by commitment and numbers. So uh, what is this in this dynamic now in this conflict situation that allows youth to do anything at all? I will say a core thing that will allow them even to survive um, uh, as doing what the work that they are doing is uh, stopping the war and providing them the means. They have the tools, the, the personal expertise, they have the, the initiatives, but with the ongoing conf conflict, with while, as long as this conflict continue and continue, they feel the, the pressure, and the international community focus on the political uh, parties more. There are some uh, initiatives, for example, the Sana'a Center is composed of a lot of youth. I would say it's one of the influencers I described uh, uh, at some sense. When we see that there is something missing in the political discourse, uh, or studies or analysis, we come in and try to present uh, a, a youth-led perspective to what's happening. For example, the economy. Uh, 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 along with other partners, we, cr we create uh, uh, a group of uh, champions, economic champions. Uh, when it comes to uh, individual youth, uh, the members themselves, we uh, take, uh, take the lead in terms of speaking with actors who are influencing the, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, what's happening in Yemen. It could be a uh, humanitarian organization, uh, diplomats, it could be other, uh, uh, other uh, 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 countries, governments. So we can sometimes find a way, but uh, uh, many other youth, they don't have the, the, the resources that they have. And sometimes, even to the local level, recently I, I've been hearing that um, it's been difficult for people from uh, age uh, eight, uh, 18 to 29 to get uh, microfinance or like loans from banks. Mm -hmm. They have stopped them and um, they are feeling the, the challenge and the pressure locally. And uh, you have to question uh, what, what's gonna be the end result for these youth? Mm -hmm. And where are we stand on this? There's a lot of us who can do something but we don't know how to do it. That, and there is something uh, and there is like a big source of uh, capital that we could invest in, but we have not uh, given enough attention to. Mm -hmm. Alsan, any other thoughts on that? Um, how groups continue, uh, so the way I've read your question is how groups continue to, to gain access and, and be able to deliver without taking one side or the mm -hmm. other, yes? And what we have to remember about local leadership groups is that they have the legitimacy and the access to local communities. They already have a pre-built network within the country that they can tap into and try to influence in the way that one they want to th they want things to go and i think the yemeni so yemeni civil society up until now in both the north and the south of the country have been able to mobilize their community members mobilize and um, advocate on whomever they need to to gain the access that they need and this is what we're realizing very quickly about the the the, the civil society movement that's happening on the humanitarian front especially um, so what they have been able to do is really navigate themselves around different groups to mm -hmm. be able to access where they need to get to. So um, around the cholera, uh, the cholera response in the north of the country, what we realized very quickly is people reacted. Um, some of the local organizations were able to react much quicker than the international organization. And this happens. This is natural. Yeah. Yes, in yeah. any crisis, it happens. But at the same time, they were able to get to areas that we weren't able mm -hmm. to access. And then they came back to some of the international organizations and said, well, we need funding to access these areas. But they weren't priority areas that we could access. So they continued to operate anyway. Mm -hmm. Voluntarily. Um, yeah. Voluntarily. Um, in the south of the country, we talk about Lahj and how difficult it is for international organizations to operate. Abiyan is also an area where it's difficult for international organizations to operate. But we do have local staff in international organizations and local organizations who continue to have the access and operate mm -hmm. within the current shifting dynamics and make sure that they have the access that they need to the communities they get to. So I guess it's this network they already have or naturally have because of being from that locality that they're able to mobilize and actually actually deliver on the ground. Yeah, well, I guess there's no authenticity then that, that comes from that that uh, they can perhaps use to some extent uh, in, their, in their work. Uh, one of the things I'm interested in, Fatima, is the, the role that 
Facebook and social media played in the past uh, as Yemeni youth communicated and began to mobilize themselves. Um, is this still a tool now that is widely employed among Yemeni youth or among Yemenis? And, and how do you see it? Is, is, again, is that something that's been politicized heavily or is it, is it used to communicate across political lines in a kind of, you know, to deliver messages of a more universal kind well, of event? It's, it's really interesting. I think that um, it, it, at 2011, this, this was a, uh, a nascent tool, Facebook, and people were just trying to figure it out. They used it to uh, organize protests and come together and uh, just mobilize their resources. So it was something that is widely used by everybody. T today, it's I think the use of that tool has been different. It's for people to articulate now their political op oppositions uh, uh, positions. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you have you know the uh, Abdel Malik Al Houthi has his own Twitter account and v Facebook page where he uh, uh, enunciates many of his uh, you know maverick ideas. Same with, you know, the president now, the, our cabinet. You could reach out to them. You could understand what, what's, you know, many of their statements come come through uh, Twitter and Facebook. I mean, uh, the prime minister had, uh, Ben Dagher had spoke about the uh, crisis with the Yemeni Rial through a, face, uh, through a Twitter post. So, and of course, it, so sort of like, it, it's really interesting to see that the older leadership and even the government now has has realized that this is a good and effective tool to reach out to uh, to the population uh, and to people. But you can also see that people are just sort of like coalescing around their own issues. So you know, people from Taiz would understand definitely their local dynamics better and would talk about their issues in Taiz as they've been under siege for the past three years since the Houthi militia. People in, in Sada would definitely talk about, you know, how, how uh, what is it that they're experiencing in their localities. The same happens with, with the South. So, uh, and people are also galvanizing uh, around their own issues that you actually see uh, lobbies in Facebook and in Twitter. Um, and uh, it was really interesting. I, I had uh, recently just spoke about the conflict between Islah and the Islah party and the South. And uh, a, a friend reached out to me and he said, uh, the conflict is only on media. <laughs> it doesn't exist. It's only on media. And I'm like, no, I'm sure it is more than that. But, you know, sort of like people positions, uh, political positions just becoming more nuanced through that. But, you know, I think I think, unfortunately, uh, the, the, again, the crackdown on on uh, on freedom of information. Uh, what we have heard is that you know at the beginning of of the crisis, sort of like this year after Saleh's execution, there were uh, Houthi militia who were just inspecting phones, you know, people's phones to see what is it that they have been sending. Uh, there has been the trial of uh, three members and, and a woman uh, on sort of like uh, cooperation with the Arab coalition. Uh, you know, and, and it was just under espionage. So it's sort of like this, this kangaroo court that just sentenced people. Uh, journalists have been detained and tortured. I mean, certainly like, you know, the, the recent Amnesty International report was just really critical and um, uh, just tragic. So people, people are sort of like, f are more cautious in terms of expressing their opinions. I have people who reach out to me through specifically Twitter who use aliases. They can't use their, their names. And they just provide information. And people I just I don't even know. They're like, listen, this is what we saw today on the street, or this is a picture that you could use. And uh, you know, and I'm like, is this your real, real name? And I would talk to them on the phone or WhatsApp or whatever, and they're like, yes, but please don't call me from an from a U.S. number. You know, we will we will be found out. So it's uh, it's just it's just a very difficult uh, situation for activists mm -hmm. at the moment. Uh, and you know, naturally, some activists have uh, room to organize. Uh, so, so sort of like if you look at places like Ma'rib, for example, it had. Uh, flourished under the, uh, you know, uh, under the Arab coalition and uh, became just one of, I mean, it's really ironic. Ma'rib was just a place that no one would go to, like, you know, 10 years ago or five years ago. You couldn't, <laughs> you know, it was just like one of the scariest places. And now it's become a really flourishing hub, you know, of, of 
commerce and other activity. Um, a place like also the south of Yemen, Adan, where Adan, Hadramaut, and other places where they're finding an outlet to, and, and they're able to come together and organize because, you know, sort of like of the environment that's around them. And, and you know, sort of like, uh, uh, being liberated from the Houthis and having no government, you know, mm. enabled sort of like a new uh, it's sort of a political mobilization uh, to come to the fore. So um, there, there are certainly like like different movements there. Um, they're 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 certainly active on on social media. Just it's it's just it's markedly different from two thousand eleven. Well, uh, I have uh, some take about uh, the media. Um, it could be, it's been used for good things and bad things, but um, it have created that distance between the civil, the, uh, the ordinary people and their representatives. Uh, so at some point we are saying like, uh, the, the current government is a Facebook government. Mm -hmm. It's uh, mm -hmm. not operating in Yemen. It's not uh, 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 talking to the people in Yemen. And uh, they are um, uh, just relying on uh, some uh, tweets and some Facebook posts to say we are doing something. Uh, that's unfortunate. That changed that uh, level of connection between uh, mm -hmm. the uh, 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 representatives and the locals. Uh, but also have been used to incite violence. Uh, that's in the negative sense. Um, uh, in the positive sense, they have maintained that connectivity between those who have uh, those youth who were in Yemen and those who are uh, who are in Yemen and those who are forced outside of Yemen, they could still continue to have that uh, communication, um, uh, and uh, uh, but ultimately it's unfortunate I will say how uh, the how how have been how, how it have been used sometimes even like sometimes by the government itself. Mm -hmm. Very true. Hassan, any thoughts on social media and its impact now? Yeah. Um, it's quite interesting. The, you, Fatma spoke about the politicization of the space. It's natural to happen in any conflict mm -hmm. and in any democracy. Um, but uh, I think what's really important is to m ensure that everyone bears the responsibility to ensure the protection of civilians at all times. Um, be it household level, be it the head of the household, the government of Yemen, the de facto authorities, um, the uh, international community, youth and women. It's our responsibility to ensure people are safe. That's the first place. Which takes me into the fact that there are some really great examples over the past year of where youth actually mobilized over social media and were able to achieve a lot. So there was a lot of, around the cholera crisis, for example, there were people sending out messages about how to avoid, um, how to protect water sources, um, I know of two groups who are um, both in, in Aden who took some information from the international organizations and decided to create these, um, these great graphics to send around to people um, through WhatsApp, which was quite interesting to see. Um, it's actually a, a, a model then we adopted as an organization and thought maybe that's a way to access more people. Um, there are people who have recorded, um, or, uh, recorded um, um, programs from radio and have placed them on social media so a wider audience can access that information. So there is there is a, a it, it is still there. So that the, if, if I can say the framework for how you can mobilize through social media is there. It's how it would be channeled outside a conflict setting and potentially be given the space. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we really think about it, it's, it's one about how the international community can provide a space for youth, women, marginalized groups, young, old, to be able to engage with societal uh, questions um, um, and ensure that they have a voice in that. But also going forward, the most importantly, which is quite current, is how they engage with the, current, with the political process um, and a, any talk of peace going forward, which is really important. I mean, we, the Yemenis missed the chance in 2011. Um, we... Um, and then the international community brought the NDC as the forefront of discussion. Um, potentially within the next peace process, there needs to be something that allows people to, to have that, to ensure that, that kind of engagement. And will social media play a role? Social media is available in Yemen. So let's uh, think about how we make that happen. But mm -hmm. it's also for the Yemenis, because at the end of the day, it is the Yemeni groups who will come up with this 
they'll come up with the ideas, they'll come up with the programs that will be able to do this. Yeah. And I think that will be vital in the future. One has a feeling that social media will certainly play a role in whatever is the next formulation, uh, I think, in terms of communicating and rallying around it creating a, a sense of a common purpose. Uh, can, certainly, as you say, can be used for destructive and negative causes, but also very very effective in terms of finding a, a, uh, a common ground. I'm, I'm Just to go back for a second, I'm interested in this idea of Yemeni activism. And I was taken by a comment that I, I read recently by a, an analyst who said that she has a feeling that, that in Yemen, activism is in and of itself a career choice. And she had an antidote about speaking to a young man who gave her his business card and it had his name and under it said activist. Um, and so this is something to me, uh, is this a Yemeni phenomenon? I mean, are Yemenis by your very nature, are you activists? Uh, or is this something that you think is just a, a phenomenon of youth more generally? I'll leave it to whoever wants to take a shot at it. It's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know if I'm the right person living outside the country for such a long time, but um, I, I'm an activist at heart, be it on British politics or Yemeni um, humanitarian issues. But I, I guess it's, um, it's something that legitimizes why you talk about certain things. Um, and there are, there are people in Yemen, from what I've noticed, um, going in and out of the country over the past 10 to 15 years, um, that don't have that legitimate backing i.e. an organization or, um, or, a, uh, or be in a position of power to be able mm -hmm. to say, I am this and this is my voice. So they tend to fall back on this activist name, mm -hmm. um, which, which is the, second, the secondary fallback. And I, I hope you agree with me mm -hmm. on that. But, but it's, it's basically a, a defense mechanism of you need to listen to me. It was quite interesting in 2011, we were sitting with, with a few policymakers and a few activists, and this is a story might, which might prove my theory on this um, a little bit, but uh, it was really interesting because um, at the question and answer time, this European policymaker turns around and says, so who are you? Why do I need to listen to you? Now, my direct response would have been, I'm a Yemeni and you need to listen to me because this is my country. Um, but <laughs> 15 other Yemenis couldn't answer this. <laughs> so... <laughs> Being so British, I put up my piece of paper and said, I'd like to answer this question. I'm really sorry, but you need to listen to these guys because they know what's happening in the country and you don't. Um, and, and the truth of the matter is who they are is the people coming from the ground. Um, they're the people who live with this on a daily basis and they have the legitimacy and you need to respect that legitimacy. And I think this is where it comes from, yes? Um, now, be it, is, is it a job or not? Does that person get money out of it or not? Does it matter? It's a calling. I think, I mean, it, you know, sort of like on the outset, it sounds ridiculous, you know, to be called an activist and a career choice. But I think it's a source of pr pride for many. Um, it's been comforting to hear Aosan on, you know, sort of like the service delivery during the conflict. Much of the activism, uh, you know, uh, sort of like the activist thing were criticized because of the lack of grassroots organization that would do service delivery. So it was sort of like just to say, you know, there's they're just the subset a subset of the population who do not do service delivery and just sit behind, you know, their desk or just like pontificate about the future of Yemen. Mm -hmm. And that was just the the concern uh, at at that time, or I think like is generally a, a general concern. But activists are are you know carrying significant risks in the country that that are stuck in the country. They um, you know they're being shot at. They're they're just enduring a lot. Um, you know, just travel from one destination to the other is is arduous, um, and I think I think sort of like being an activist is just. I, I think they're sort of like trying to say that you know we belong somewhere, we belong in a civil society. Mm -hmm. You know, in a in a country where there's a high unemployment rate. You know, it's sort of like you're saying they're saying we're here and we have a role. You know, despite the fact that we're not employed. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, just, just a way for them to legitimize who even, you know, who they are. So sort of like, you know, going back to that, that uncomfortable setting or question that you were asked, um, you know, they, it's sort of like, and I, I get that, I get that all the time. It's like, you know, why, why should they care? It's because they have an issue and that's, that's basically what they're trying to get across. But it's, it's, I, I think, I think at the core of it, much of the criticism was just because of the lack of, you know, sort of like it's just a criticism about are you are you delivering any services or are you just sitting behind a desk doing mm -hmm. nothing and mm -hmm. talking? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Waleed, any thoughts? Uh, it's, I think, uh, uh, briefly, uh, they uh, covered it really well, is that mm -hmm. it speaks for their desire to, uh, to make a change. Yeah. It's something that is continuing with Yemenis. They want to, uh, they have this aspiration. They want to change. They want a new future. They want a new chapter. But currently, they have been stuck and blocked by the conflict and by mm -hmm. traditional forces like tribes, political parties, some movements that are not reflective, actually, of what the, the, the general youth uh, aspires to. Mm -hmm. Th there's a, uh, an argument being made that when, because of the conflict, because of the terrible tragedy that has befallen Yemen, that the current generation of leadership um, will be so thoroughly discredited mm. uh, at the end of the conflict that it will fall mm. to the youth, who will be the only sector of society that will, will be seen to a great extent as having been not diminished um, by their involvement in this conflict. And that will be a vacuum that needs to be filled and youth can step into that to take this over. Is that a, a legitimate, realistic aspiration for youth to, to say that maybe these old, the old types will just fall by the wayside and we will have a chance? That, you know, to go back to your initial mm -hmm. point, Waleed, we will not be disregarded or dismissed because there will be no one else to turn to. It's, it's, a, it's a nice picture. It's like the one that, that we had in 2011 when we believe that the youth could, you know, I mean, the youth carried, carried the movement. You know, whether independent or political, they carried the movement, but ultimately, were they really part of the political settlement and part of the political negotiations in the process? And they were not. It was the negotiations that happened with the leadership of the movement, and they were sidelined. And in, in, it, it, to be honest, you know, many reached out and said, that's fine. We, you know, we, we are the, uh, you know, we provide that force for them. And, and at that time, I think there was so much emphasis on just Saleh as a persona and, and overthrowing him. But the question of what comes next after Saleh, who negotiates, was just not really fleshed out and was not important. They, they saw success with the fall of Saleh. The fact that Saleh had, you know, a, a deeply entrenched uh, legacy of corruption that was, you know, uh, rooted in many of state institutions did not seem to matter so much, you know. It was like, okay, that, that's going to sort itself out once you cut off the head of the, of the snake, then, you know, the, the rest is going to be fine, and it wasn't. So they were not part of the political settlement that, that was brokered by the GCC, and how, I mean, how could they? I mean, there was also no youth party. So how do you really talk about youth? There were youth within, there was youth within the Houthis, there was youth within the, the General People's Congress, which is Saleh's party. There were youth within Islah. But you know you cannot just separate them. The independent youth. What what happened? You know to them. So their their voice was diminished. And I feel like currently, you know, I uh, Walid has mentioned that there are so many of the leadership that is not there. And yes, there's a youth bulge in Yemen. But how how is it that they're organizing their voice politically? Mm -hmm. Is the question. You know, it's there's no political party. What what stands to to you know, just talk about youth. You know, maybe the closest thing I could see to youth is whether it's like Islah youth who are mm -hmm. in Taiz and in Ma'rib, um, and these are you know a, a, a big number. And then you've got the youth in the south of Yemen, which are in a huge number. You know, and uh, sort of like becoming, and and it's really it's it's uplifting because the the Hirak in 2007 when it's when sort of like I mean I think it started around 2007 started with old leadership and old mentality and you know and all of these are no longer members you know s s they've merged from Hirak to the Southern Transitional Council but and, and they've you know everything is just blending in but you can definitely see the youth carrying out the movement you know in the Southern Transitional Council and in, and in different elements of, of also the South so uh, they're becoming aware the problem here is that you know, again, the, 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 the resourcing uh, and equipping of these movement, uh, understanding that this leadership is something that you can, you know, uh, uh, integrate and nurture. Uh, in 2011, you know, that lack of organization was their Achilles heel. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to really pay attention uh, to these movements that, that are there on the ground and find a way to channel their voices. Right. And uh, Alsan, on that subject, on that point, um, how do, y y you know, Yemen youth who are now involved in political parties, involved in political activities, how do they not become tainted by that? And, they, and how do they reclaim a kind of a, uh, a sense of, I can be a, uh, a leader for all, as opposed to a leader for a certain you know, element in this country? 
Um, um, I, I guess it's um, it, it'd be a really interesting transition that we make. Um, Yemen is facing a loss of a generation in the next, well, right now. We're still going through a conflict that's devastating minds, that's not allowing the, the next generation to have a viable education, nor be able to access vital services to continue to live. And that's the reality, yes? Um, on the back of that, um, this is the war scenario and the continuing one. And as, as much as the war would continue, the harder it will get to save that generation and to save the generations after that. I mean, I was arguing with another Yemeni ex-youth member <laughs> 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 only, a, only a few days ago on WhatsApp whether we will lose two or three generations. What a sad conversation mm. to have, yes? Mm. Um, but it's, it's, it's a current conversation. It's what can I do sitting in the UK to save as many people as I can, cousins, uncles, um, uh, um, uncles, sons, daughters, and so on. How can I send them some books that I can save some of the intellect? How can I give them some new ideas? How can I help from sitting from the outside, just as a Yemeni? Um, now, against the role of the old, will the old disappear? Who knows? Um, it's going to be a great question for the future. But as long as the war continues, youth won't have space yeah. to have any real influential part in delivering anything at a national or mm -hmm. even local level that's more substantive in looking forward to a, to a brighter future. Um, within peace, there are clear examples going back all the way to the 60s, um, if you'd like to go back, of youth picking up the buck and saying, we can bring together something. There are, I'm sure, people in this room who are in the 60s within the youth movements, either in Taiz or in Aden, who fought and really worked hard um, to, to make sure that they, have, they create the space for themselves to be part of a new governance system. And they were influential in bringing together that governance system. In 2011, we saw accountants, doctors, um, um, uh, lawyers take major positions from the youth movement in probably one of the only technocratic governments that Yemen's had in a very, very long time. Um, and it was a really interesting change. There was a lot of hope around that. And this hope could come back, yes? But under, under the current circumstances, it's just not available for people to even think about. Um, so I hope that's, uh, that kind of answers the question. Well, it does kind of answer the question. I think it's, it's a little bit difficult to know with any certainty. But, Waleed, yeah. do you have any thoughts about uh, the future of youth leadership? Yes. Um, well, if we look, look at the uprising itself, it was leaderless. There's no leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, a movement by youth that mobilized under some common themes. It's difficult to find now a clear vision for youth at the moment, given the divisions, given the... Um, uh, the actors are involved, given to what extent some of the youth who even were in the streets now ally themselves to particular parties or what type of ideologies they take. Um, will they uh, have an opportunity if these new generations, well, ultimately, this, uh, the current generation will ultimately die and sometimes they are killing each other at the moment. Uh, so youth may have uh, some uh, future, but they don't have, uh, I mentioned earlier, they don't have the resources to, do, to mobilize, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, advocate. And the ones who have the resources and the guns are the countries who are involved and, they, uh, and the ones who are recruiting them. The countries at the moment, uh, when they, uh, they, we have seen the UN lead some, facilitate some uh, uh, peace processes in Kuwait two and Geneva one, And where were youth? They weren't included. The ones who had the gun were able to make it to the table. But where are youth? Uh, we, uh, that's a question for the international community in dealing with uh, mm -hmm. youth. Mm -hmm. Even the GCC or Gulf countries, when it comes to like helping youth, if they want to really help youth, not to give them arms to go and fight, they have to help them in different means. More uh, to, to, to make them, to, to be barren for the future, to be barren to lead a peaceful country, a, be a peaceful neighbor. But they have not uh, done that, unfortunately. Just, what, what, just a quick question. What were your suggestion would be for sort of like a youth representative or an envoy? How would that, how would that take place? How would that take shape? Um, how can they find them? Like how, what, what type of, I was just thinking about this like for a while yeah. and I think it's just, you know, 
who speaks for who ultimately yeah. like for example when we had Tawakkul Karman at one point everybody was you know people were upset they're like yeah. she does not represent us all so yeah. what represents you yeah. um, uh, the, 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 to reach that point or even that discussion the war have to end to stop mm-hmm. um, uh, there is a, a, a vacuum at the moment about the youth doesn't have a vision they are so divided the South, uh, if, if you bring in people from the uh, youth from the South, they have different visions from those maybe in different uh, areas in the country, and vice versa. Uh, some of them, uh, it's difficult, but uh, if you want to start any meaningful discussions about the role of youth, the, the, the conflict had to stop and uh, Rome had to be facilitated for it. All right, with that, let me see if I can turn the uh, discussion over to some of you. And I invite you, if you have any questions, there's a microphone that will be passing around here momentarily. And uh, please, um, I think Horacio has got his hand up there. And we're getting microphones mobilized even as we speak. Uh, I can yell loud. Okay, there you go, Horacio. <laughs> uh, Horacio, you're at a former uh, Foreign Service Office in the Department of State. Appreciate all that you've said, and obviously, you know, you have chaos in Yemen, especially with the opportunities. For the youth, you never mentioned anything about, you know, their susceptibility to extremism, mm-hmm. i.e. Daesh or... Al Qaeda are being drawn into anything like that. How do you view, you know, they're being drawn into extremism and all the problems that go with that? It's a really great question. Is is this now becoming a uh, a career choice? Uh, I could answer now. Please. Yes, um, it's a, a serious issue uh, because we have seen some, for example, ex- uh, of individuals who are. Salafis, extremist Salafis, and there is a fine line when it comes to engaging in conflict. When they are in conflict, there is a very fine and close line where they could just like become extremists to the point where they be considered as AQAB. Uh, that's a serious challenge, but uh, also because of the resources. Some youth, they don't have any other alternatives but to go, but some of them also, because Houthis, they force youth to go to the front lines. They, uh, they, uh, th- there is like, uh, at the moment, there is an investment in conflict rather than uh, opportunities for them. Um, but it's a very big, serious issue. And uh, for example, if, uh, if there is a serious, uh, meaningful way of dealing with youth, uh, you have to talk to the actors who are currently at the moment uh, recruiting them, because some of these uh, the tribes could, it could cut the, 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 their kids from going to uh, the, these groups to fight on behalf of these uh, militias or mm-hmm. actors. Any other thoughts on the lure of extremism to Yemeni youth at the moment? I mean, just it, on, on, on the issue of child soldier, has been, I've been researching this issue extensively. About, you know, 72%, uh, according to the United Nations, about 72% of uh, uh, children in 2017, uh, within a certain uh, uh, number and demographic, were, um, were recruited by the Houthi militia. Um, some, you know, perhaps around 10% were recruited by local popular committees that are affiliated, sort of like pro-government uh, entities, and about 9 to 10% were recruited by Al-Qaeda. So it is a serious problem. Economic conditions, you know, difficult conditions during the war uh, still drive this, and, and at cer- certain times, ideological uh, uh, mobilization. Al Qaeda is really interesting in Yemen. Uh, a friend of mine called them their gangs for hire, basically. So whoever is funding them uh, and and recruiting them to do whatever they're doing, they're, it, it, it's it's just they're just mo- they're just motivated by really uh, money, and uh, uh, I don't think there is a strong traction for them in Yemen. And I think that you know we've just re- he recently um, heard about. Um, uh, Hadramaut and what's going on in Hadramaut in terms of like the capture of of some uh, Al Qaeda members and Al Qaeda cells in, in Hadramaut and that was just over the weekend and uh, in other areas I I know in the south of Yemen this has been uh, problematic as and again this was another research that I've done um, in 2016 and 17 there were over a uh, hundred terrorist attacks on the south. Contrasting with the north, there were like perhaps two or three terrorist attacks. And uh, for the majority of the southerners, they're seeing this as um, sort of a way, uh, structural violence that is coming and and Al-Qaeda 
is, is basically has been paid through uh, a former president, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, to cause uh, turbulences in the South and to basically, um, um, you know, sort of like uh, disrupt the progress that had happened after after the liberation from the Houthi and uh, uh, and Saleh, Saleh forces in 2015. So there are political incentives to to the way that Al Qaeda operates, financial and political incentives more so than ideological uh, incentive that we have to pay attention to. And and we know very well that you know Ali Abdullah Saleh was in bed with Al Qaeda at at a certain time. So it's just it's it's a. I think that's something that we have to just really be be cognizant cognizant of. Um, it's an important question. Okay. Another question. Uh, we have one over here, I believe, Sarah. Hi. Um, I, I, I heard a, a number of our panelists mention, um, in a sense, indicate that uh, some of the modern movements today are related to the youth movement. And I wanted to kind of ask that question again. Uh, to what degree are the movements that we see today in Yemen, uh, uh, you know, an outgrowth from the youth movements in 2011, or are they in opposition to those? We see a little bit of opposition. Um, you know, they don't affiliate themselves with the February 11th revolution. They don't celebrate it. The Houthis don't. Herak doesn't. Many of them don't. Uh, but in another sense, Abdul Malik al Houthi is 33 years old. A number of Herak commanders are, are youth. Uh, so to what degree are these are these related or are they in conversation with each other? H how should we understand uh, that in context? Anybody? To, to what degree are Hirak and uh, and Houthis are sorry. Oh, I see. I see what you mean. It's really interesting. Um sorry if I if I may. Uh, it's a it's an interesting question because I think uh, uh, things have really diverged since 2011, and the movements have just taken, I mean, uh, there were two groups, both the Houthis and the, the Hirak in, in the South. The Hirak were really bystanders in 2011. They, by, yeah, bystanders. They did not necessarily effectively participate in Change Square in Sana'a. There were some members of the Yemen Socialist Party, but mostly the Hirak were, just felt that, Whatever happens in Sana'a, just let it happen. Let events unfold, you know. And uh, if they overthrow Saleh, then that's good for us. If they don't, we're, we're just going to deal with it later. So uh, in a sense, they were just watching what was going on uh, in, in the urban area and the capital. Same with the Houthis. Houthis were members in, in also Change Square. Um, but I, f I felt that they were much more like studying the dynamics and trying to understand what was really going on within the movement. Uh, so fast forward to today, seven years later, and I think, um, you know, the Hirak had uh, now just evolved. You know, it's no longer Hirak. We don't, we don't refer to it, uh, to the movement in the South as Hirak. We have now the Southern Transitional Council and, you know, of which some members of Hirak are members of. And of course, you know, it's not, not all of the Southerners are behind the Southern Transitional Council. Of course, there will be naturally, you know, divisions and different agendas uh, in the South. That's only to be expected. Uh, but uh, I think that the movement has sort of like, or, or the Southern movement in particular has learned from its mistakes and, you know, the, the main criticism of it back in 2011 was that there was no leadership uh, at that time. And, and today, you know, there is leadership. And, and then the other interesting thing is, might have been some lessons learned also from the Houthi takeover because the Southern Transitional Council has also come in uh, uh, tandem with the Southern Resistance. Uh, forces, they are. So the Southern Resistance Forces, which is sort of like, again, another uh, independent, independent local uh, militia in the South, working hand in hand to just create that power and to just say, you know, maybe not now, but down the line, we're going to be a force that, that you know, to be reckoned with. So that was really interesting to watch in the South of Yemen. And then, you know, I, I mean, that's just my take on the South. Right. Hassan, any thoughts on how the youth movement may have informed other uh, movements uh, in Yemen? Um, I guess to answer your question, you'd look, you'll have to look at the, his, the, 
the latest that's happened to make this ha all happen. Um, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to go to the escalation of conflict here. I'm going to go back to the NDC because that's the last mm -hmm. time everyone spoke to each other potentially on a, on a political level. And what the NDC has failed to do is potentially raise three important points. One, that Sada and the southern issues are two vital um, grievances that had to be resolved. And three, that a new constitution need to be written ASAP to include everything else that the NDC came up with. And it's, we're talking about 1,000 plus recommendations here from a six month process. Um, so if you really look at just those three issues, you'll see that the, 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 civil, the civil society movements have kind of divided into those three factions, yes? So you've got the Southern movement, you have a, a Houthi movement in the North, mm -hmm. and then you have the independent kind of independent youth who are looking at service delivery, looking at becoming humanitarians, looking at um, ensuring that there's access to, to, to um, vital services and so on. And that kind of falls under the constitutional thing and how do we bring that together? And they still discuss it at that local level. So potentially that's how they're working together. Um, and my, my kind of just overview of that is that the, the NDC didn't provide this space to just come up with a solution for these three grievances, so they continue to happen. Um, so that's where, that's where I would say it, it, it would be and how it's kind of worked out in the past few years. Mm -hmm. Okay, questions? Please, right here, Doug. Uh, this is really following on uh, your last comment, but should the youth outside of Yemen and inside of Yemen be trying to organize a party? Are not just the youth, but the post-youth? <laughs> should you be trying to organize somehow a political party? Takers? <laughs> I'm a humanitarian. <laughs> 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 I don't do politics. Right, um, we'll, let, we'll, let, we'll let Waleed take a crack at that then. <laughs> well, should there be an effort underway now to form a, a political party, yeah, anticipating the opportunity post-conflict uh, when politics will once again be within the realm yeah. of the possible? Um, it's There need to be, uh, from my point of view, if you look at a... Um, it's almost impossible at the moment, given the divisions, what this political party will represent, what youth, what mm -hmm. segment of youth within Yemen this political party will represent. Um, it's difficult for, to foresee. As long as there is like a national consensus about future Yemen, how the makeup should be, and, uh, and how the composition of the representation of uh, Yemenis will be formulated, then maybe youth will see how they could f be an added value or fit in within that system. Um, I, I, it's difficult, I think, uh, mm. to foresee at the moment. Also, I mean, to that point, um, uh, what credibility would they have outside of the country? So that's the that's main question here, you know, and, and um, again, one of the things that I continue to hear from, you know, people on the ground is that they feel that they're isolated and they're disenfranchised and, um, you know, probably a little bit, uh, you're just, just really upset that, you know, others are not just suffering in the way that they are suffering. So uh, what credibility would that be? I mean, it would sort of like be mostly imposed, you know, on, on, uh, on youth in Yemen. So it would, it would, I just don't see it as fair. Um, the, other, the other issue is that um, s some people think that organizing as a party under the current, you know, internationally recognized government would just uh, end up uh, bringing more fragmentation mm. because, you know, just sort of like, you know, the, the, the Southerners would want to have their own party, but even within the South, there would be so many parties that, that could, that could uh, come up, the same with other entities. And we, we're, we're seeing so many regional issues come up in Yemen, you know, uh, people are coalescing again behind their own political uh, agenda. So uh, that's, another, uh, that's another concern. I think just more importantly, Please. if I just add on yes, this point, I think, I think more importantly what we really need to think about is not building a national body that holds the group together um, or potentially brings a political voice to the table, but rather think about, um, from an international perspective, rather think about how um, we can support these groups. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. you have spoken about the ability um, and the accessibility to funds and ETC 
Um, but how, how do we access groups on the ground and ensure that they are linked to some of these groups on, on the outside and they they understand what the grievance of the inside, because that's one of the biggest things that I see as, as, as a risk going forward is that there is an intellectual group of Yemenis sitting outside, a very highly well-trained intellectual group of Yemenis who really don't know what's happening inside the country other than phone calls, um, haven't really lived through the last three years and don't understand local grievances at the level they are at. I mean, we are talking about community, inter-community um, infighting. We are talking about um, displaced people in new communities. That's a really new dynamic for me to see. And and how do you bring that localized peace that's happening? Because people aren't killing pe each other at that local level. Yes, they are coexisting. They are trying to live together. There are still northerners in the south of the country, I presume. I haven't been to the south to mm. say I was there and I saw it. Mm. Um, but I, I know there, there are people there and there are southerners in the north of the country. I saw my grandmother, my uncles, they're still in Sana'a. Um, and these people are coexisting. So how is this peace formed? How, how do we ensure that these voices actually come up to, to the international level and to, and to the national level when we start talking about peace? And I think that's the first step towards, towards anything that would work and to, towards making a difference to start with. Hmm. Fascinating. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I have a question then. Um, and uh, Alsan, it goes to you to begin with, because uh, you said something really interesting a moment ago, uh, and that was that the National Dialogue Conference was perhaps the last time all the Yemenis actually sat around and talked with each other. And I guess my question is, is there still, do you think, an opportunity to use kind of that ethos, that ethic of a national dialogue to bring Yemenis from their disparate corners mm -hmm. back to a center? Uh, back to a place where you say, you may be Houthi, you may be a Salahi, you may be STC, you may be somebody, but we have a common cause here. Um, is, that, is that still something that you think, you know, could we conceive of, a, and I don't want to call it a national dialogue conference, but, but an event uh, to which youth could congregate and see themselves again as forming a kind of a nucleus of political power? Mm. Um, it's quite interesting because I... I, I read a civic report a few a few a week ago um, uh, um, that interviewed 71 families at the local level and every family have said the main objective is peace everyone wanted what do you want mm -hmm. I want peace now is it peace linked to the fact that they've lost their livelihood is it peace linked to the fact that they've lost their right to land is it peace Linked to, and we can go off through them all, yes, access to services, ETC, but what, they, what people do want is peace, yes? So there is a common agenda across the country. Everybody wants peace. So how do you bring that? And where is the forum? forum and what does the forum look like? Mm. Um, would, be, would be what um, I guess the specialists need to discuss and, and bring together. Um, the NDC was, was a, a, um, a wonderful process in that it brought women into the room, um, it gave them a voice and a very strong voice at that. Mm -hmm. But but what is next? And and I think I just feel like if we focus at this high level, these are the people that need to be discussing what peace looks like in the future. Mm -hmm. um, we might be really falling, having a lot of people fall through the cracks. And, and those are the people that matter right mm -hmm. now. It's those people at that local level who are making decisions mm -hmm. um, and either making decisions on behalf of people that make people's lives good or making decisions on behalf of people that are making people's lives bad. Um, and there is no centralized command. There's no centralized control or governance to this. So how do we make sure that localized peace is transiting and then, and then ensure that there is a, a wider body that discusses what that could look like at the local level and ensuring that we give big best practice? I mean, to what extent are there, that are there programs that give best practice to local groups? Mm -hmm. um, there are, um, and there are, there are really successful um, case studies from across the world on that. So we just need to think outside the box a little bit more. And I think we've always focused on this upper group in Yemen. How do we make sure mm -hmm. that they're engaged in peace? But uh, the deviation of power has been unbelievable over the past three years that we have to really consider going local. Mm -hmm. Wonderful idea, well mm -hmm. lead. Mm. No, I totally agree uh, yeah. uh, about this. Well, the m any venues, uh, I, I add to this, like um, any venues will need to like uh, focus on capacity building uh, of uh, youth at uh, the 
the vertical and uh, horizontal lines. Um, but something also that need to be maybe an opportunity is to, f to at least try to listen to them, listen to their concerns. Not necessarily come to, to an agree uh, that they could come up with something transformative for the country uh, in a political means or something, but uh, bringing them uh, uh, closer to the outside world, uh, those who are in the local. You bring them out, put them together, and then get the international community to hear them. Because these governments, they have their ambassadors, they have their um, uh, representatives. They meet with the government officials. Very few uh, youth, youth sometimes will have the privilege to be outside. Uh, but uh, we need to uh, rethink this, but also take, take lessons from what happened before, lessons learned from the National Dialogue Conference. What are the failures, what were the opportunities? And uh, see how, 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 how can we like, uh, de uh, 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 give them room away from the traditional forces, the political parties, and the, not as representatives of political parties, rather, than, uh, rather than, uh, as um, youth in different places within Yemen. Mm -hmm. Fatima? Yeah, um, the, the National Dialogue Conference was a really <coughs> good exercise. Um, that ended, and uh, I think we need to return back to the outcomes of the National Dialogue Conference. Uh, repeating it uh, again might not be very prudent uh, at this time. Uh, one of the problems that accompanied the National Dialogue Conference is that people felt isolated and marginalized yeah. within, uh, you know, at, at the time of the event, um, as, as there was just this political circus in, in the capital, and you know, people had bread and butter issues, you know, immediate economic grievances mm -hmm. that they were just promised to be solved. It was that type of environment that allowed the Houthis to come in and you know, uh, uh, have their power grab in the capital because they were saying, you know what, the government is not delivering services and we're going to try to, tra to take a, a crack at this. So um, uh, this it, sort of like emphasis on, on political structures or political dialogue is going to be very difficult when, yes, we have to think about, you know, first of all, is sort of like the war has to stop, you know. The disarming of, of, the, of the Houthi militia is fundamental, and it has to be some, a peaceful political solution because, you know, I mean, Yemen is at its core a tribal structure. People don't, I mean, people don't forget their thar or their revenge. So, uh, you know, if, if we don't tackle these things peacefully, if we don't come to a consensus-based uh, uh, solution, we're just going to, you know, this, this conflict is just going to deepen uh, with time. So, you know, fundamentally, that, that's really important. But what's really important is to learn also from former mistakes. And the NDC was just overly optimistic, but the mistake is that it had failed to address core conflict issues, whether A, it was with service delivery, or, or B, in um, the political distribution of, of power. Well, all right. I think with that, we were going to wrap this up. Um, my deep thanks to Fatima, to uh, Alsan, and to Walid for joining us today, for sharing your thoughts with us. It's been, a, for me, a wonderful discussion. I'm terribly encouraged to sit with the three of you uh, to think that the future is in your hands. So uh, please um, get to work, if you would. And, and, uh, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Once again, it's great to see the, uh, the Yemen crowd gather. Much appreciated. Thank you.